Chris, are you still there? I am indeed, yes. Hello. So, okay, let me make an introduction for you. Okay, thank you, everyone. My name is Jonathan Mesa. I'm representing Newark, Newark in Mexico. And the next conference, of a round of conference, we have been here and this event that we were invited with this Chris Bottas from Raspberry. And he's going to talk about the new models and stuff. Chris? Hello. So just one second. Uh, let me, um, can, can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. yes. Wonderful. So hello. I'm Chris Boris. Um, I'm in the commercial team at Raspberry Pi. I've been here about six months. Um, I'm based in California, um, in San Francisco, um, helping Raspberry Pi uh, get uh, and support new customers in America. Um, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to um, attend today. Um, I look forward to talking to you about a few different topics. So I'm going to give you an overview of Raspberry Pi 5 which we just started shipping talk to you about about our compute module and um which is we're on version four of our compute module um and that's shipping uh, has been shipping for a while now and um we have a microcontroller that we de designed ourselves and i'll talk to you a little bit about that and then um there will be time for questions um, and hopefully some answers at the end. Um, but if you want, you can stop me as we're going through. I'll stop at each section and um, I'll stop at the end of each section and see if people have questions. All right, so um, let's talk about Raspberry Pi 5. So Raspberry Pi 5, uh, we launched it, uh, we announced it publicly about a month ago and we started shipping just earlier this week, in fact. So many, many, many thousands of units have been shipped to end customers via our amazing reseller network um, of um, uh, resellers all over the world. Um, and so they're now hitting the basically end customers and uh, the feedback has been really positive so far. The launch went really well. Lots of exciting press about it. Um, reviewers have been using it and loving it and writing up some amazing articles. We're very very happy about the reception it's had. And now we're um, ramping mass production, getting it into um, um, consumers, uh, hobbyists, makers, hands, um, and it's going extremely well. We're very pleased about it. So just to start off with a little bit of a comparison between the Raspberry Pi 4 and the Raspberry Pi 5. So first off, um, I've just hold up stuff here to the, to the camera. Hopefully you can see. So this one, this one is Raspberry Pi 5, Raspberry Pi 4. So it's exactly the same form factor. Um, so the, the board dimensions are pretty much exactly the same. Um, the connectors have moved, but I'll talk about that in a second. But what we have done is we've increased the performance of the whole system about two to three times the performance going from Raspberry Pi 5 to Raspberry Pi 4. So big, big step up in, improve, uh, in performance. We have... Um, memory variants ranging from one to eight gigabytes so one two four and eight gigabytes of of sd ram um and the sd ram is faster now so it's lpddr4 running a really fast clock frequency um at launch we've only shipped we're currently only manufacturing the four gigabyte and the eight gigabyte variants but in the future we'll start producing the one and two gigabyte variants one of the great things that we've added to the product um, that was not on the um, Raspberry Pi 4 is one of the things we've added is PCIe, which comes out to this connector here. So PCI Express is um, a bus that's heavily used in computing and embedded computing. And um, we now have a direct connection between the main CPU on the system and this PCIe port. 
so it allows people to to hook up all sorts of things like solid state solid state disks uh, nvms other network interfaces other high speed peripherals we've also increased the speed of the usb interfaces on the product um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, later on in the slide deck about how we've done that, but we've doubled the bandwidth. Um, we've created um, a, a faster SD card interface so that the actual SD card bus, which is where most of the file system lives on most people's systems, will uh, run about twice as fast, so much faster file system access. The power circuitry is all completely changed uh, from Pi 4 to Pi 5. We have a custom piece of silicon from Dialog to do our power management. Uh, Dialog is um, uh, a company um, that is now owned by Renesas, but um, they've developed a fantastic piece of power uh, power circuitry for us. And we now have a real time clock with a battery backup. Uh, there's a port for a battery backup um, interface. So, but the real time clock is built into the power management system. Um, and then we have a little connector for the battery to keep that bat the real time clock running. Even if you depower the main power supply on the board, the real time clock will maintain its time base. OK, um, so I'm just going to walk you around the board bit by bit and explain what each what's changed on each on each part of the system. Um, so one of the main things to start out with is we've gone from um, the 2711 processor that was used on the Raspberry Pi 4. We've moved to the 2712, so one better, but it's actually a lot better. Um, so it's uh, two to three times faster for most CPU intensive application, um, you know, basically applications. Um, it runs uh, at 2.4 gigahertz and it's an A76 core versus an A72 that was in the Raspberry Pi 4. So uh, it's a massively upgraded ARM core, um, uh, ARM V8 instructions, which is pretty similar to what was available in the A72s of the Raspberry Pi 4. But we've increased the cache sizes significantly. Um, so we've got half a megabyte L2 caches and then a, a big pool of L3 cache, which is shared between all four cores. And that's two megabytes now. It was one megabyte on a previous chip. Um, it actually contains um, the image sensor pipeline so the isp which is basically our camera processor that's actually raspberry pi developed ip in a broadcom chip very proud of that it's a really high performance um, and produces great looking images it can handle one gigapixel per second so an awful lot of throughput and that allows us to handle multiple cameras and multiple resolutions in parallel if we want to we've improved or broadcom have improved the hardware video scaler and a display pipeline. So this chip can now uh, drive two 4K panels at 60 frames a second with separate frame buffers in each. In each. And the, the 3D core that's used to render a lot of that graphics um, has got a lot better as well. So we've gone up, basically doubled the, the, the GPU throughput for the, the product. And now it supports OpenGLES 3.1 and Vulkan uh, 1.3. Um, so those have all been moved up to the, the the most modern versions of those standards. And we have a hardware video decoder in there that can do 4K at 60 frames a second video decode. And now for other codecs that aren't H.264 or H.265, I should say, we do those in software on the ARM because there's enough ARM CPU to do it all in software. So we've had to, um, one thing that's changed with Pi 5 is we've moved the USB and Ethernet con connectors around, um, and that was for board layout reasons. Um, so it's uh, one thing to be aware of. It's not a huge drawback. I mean, it means that it won't fit into the same cases as before, but there's thermal reasons why you wouldn't want to put it in the same case as before anyway. Um, we've changed the way the MIPI buses work on the product. So the MIPI buses on Pi 4 used to come out here and here. So camera or well, display there and camera there. And um, what we've done is we've gone for two parallel connectors. Now, this is better for a bunch of different reasons, but um, for board area wise, uh, these are finer, finer pitch connectors, uh, smaller form factor, but finer pitch, higher pin count, but finer pitch. Um, and now that allows us to bring out two four lane MIPI buses mm -hmm. and each can be a display or a camera. So you can have two cameras or two displays. And that's really important for lots of stereo vision applications as well. 
Um, and you can still use the same camera sensors that we sold previously. And uh, oh, the, the camera sensors that we sell today uh, will work with Raspberry Pi 5. You just have to buy a different flex connector, but they're very, um, the FPCs are um, pretty inexpensive. Oh, sorry, slide's not working. Um, so one of the major improvements between Pi 4 and Pi 5 is that we've added our own custom Southbridge controller. Um, and this is a piece of silicon that was developed in-house at Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're very proud of it. It's um, basically an I.O. controller for all of the I.O. on the board, uh, except for HDMI. And it's the first time that we've used our own silicon um, in a full size Raspberry Pi product. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other silicon that we've done. Um, we've shipped that previously with um, our Pico product line. But in essence, this is what we call a South Bridge. So it's um, in a PC, it would be considered to be a South Bridge style product. Um, and it, it runs the majority of the I.O. for Raspberry Pi 5. So USB, Ethernet, um, the 40 pin connector, uh, controlling uh, various other things on the board all happen through this RP1 I.O. controller. Um, and in terms of what's in it, so it's got a four lane PCIe 2 bus between the main CPU and the I.O. controller. So that gets you each one of those is a five giga transfer per second bus. So at, at five rate, that will get you 20 mega transfers or giga transfers per second. So roughly 20 gigabits per second between the two um, between the two chips. That's the, the phi rate, not the achieved rate. That, that'll be a little bit lower because there's some efficiencies in there. Um, we have gigabit ethernet on the product and that uses what's called RGMII to connect to an external phi that gets us really fast, really high throughput uh, ethernet on the product. Great for networking applications. Uh, we have a pair of USB 3 host controllers. So I mentioned earlier that the bandwidth for this product um, when you're using the USB ports versus a Pi 4, it's about twice as fast. And the reason we were able to get that is we have a pair of uh, very high performance USB 3 controllers that also do USB 2. But in terms of USB 3 mode, we have a pair of separate controllers that all but basically each one of these connectors has its own controller attached and that gets you really high throughput. And each one of those can do five giga or five gigabits per second. Again, fire rate. Um, we have upgraded our MIPI bus, so we get four lanes at 1.5 gigabits per second. So that's tons of bandwidth for doing camera and display driving. We have a triple video DAC, so three DAC video output. We're only using one of those on Raspberry Pi 5, but that's for um, composite video. Um, and we can do all sorts of other modes, including VGA output if we wanted to from this chip. And then we have a bunch of low speed peripherals that the Linux user land can, or kernel in fact, can, can access via the, the RP1 Southbridge. So SPY, UR, I2C, PWM, GPIO, et cetera, and i 2 s that's basically what makes up our 40 pin connector. It's kind of what makes a Raspberry Pi a Raspberry Pi. It's built into the RP1. Um, we've got some PWM out, and the whole thing is in a 12 by 12.65 pitch package. So it's designed to be brought out on um, uh, a non HDI board. Um, we now have an on off button. So you can tap it to turn the, uh, you can tap it to ask the OS to uh, go into like a suspend mode, uh, hold it down, I believe, turns the product off. Um, oh, hold it down, resets it, in fact, sorry, yes. Um, but it's the first product that we built with an on-off switch, so super useful. Um, we have a tiny little connector for our real-time clock. So this is where the battery attaches to the system to power the real-time clock. So when you reset the board or remove the power to the board, you don't lose your time base. Um, we have the power management IC that I mentioned before from Dialog. That's a custom piece of silicon that was designed specifically to work with Raspberry Pi 5. Um, and it's got some really neat features, like we can measure current consumption on a per rail basis when we're running. So we can actually get real-time stats about how much um, 
uh, power the board is consuming, which is useful for thermal information, but also useful for just being able to, to, to measure things on our production line as well, make sure things are all working correctly. So it's part of our um, part of our manufacturing test now. So it's pretty good. Um, we have a dedicated UART connector on the board. Um, so back in back back before you had to get your soldering iron or your breadboard out to uh, to attach a console out from the chip as it was booting um, and to get that that hardware console out of the, the, the product. And now you just plug in a connector and that connector also matches up. To the connector that is on the. Um, our little debug probe that we sell as well, so it makes it really easy for people to um, to access the, uh, the console. It's super useful for development and test. Um, we've moved the PoE hat connector around. The hat is basically what generates the the supply voltage from power over Ethernet. So if you want to use a Raspberry Pi 5, we have a Pi hat, we have a PoE hat for Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, but if you want to use uh, PoE with or power over Ethernet with Raspberry Pi 5, we are developing a new hat that will um, work on will will work with this product to generate those voltages for, um, for PoE operation. We have uh, heat sink mounts. This is this product's been designed from the ground up with um, with a heat spreader in mind. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. There's a connector for the, the interface to the fan. So we've developed our um, our Raspberry Pi uh, active cooler, and this is a fan based product that will um, allow you to run the Raspberry Pi 5 at maximum, basically maximum load without thermal throttling. So this will take all of the heat out of the product and dissipate it into the atmosphere. Um, and it's uh, being manufactured and sold by us and uh, through our reseller network. Uh, it works really well. Uh, attaches to the board very securely. It's very easy to fit with the bayonets. Um, and then once it's attached to the board, um, the the fan will be automatically controlled through, through some firmware running in the RP1. And basically, what it'll do is it'll only turn the fan on when when it's needed. It's a very quiet fan anyway, but it'll it'll vary the 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 fan velocity as well, so you get maximum efficient cooling. Um, and you're not, you know, spinning up the fan, getting wear and tear on the fan uh, when it's not required. So it's proper intelligent fan control. Um, so one of the biggest additions, as I mentioned before, was the PCIe interface that's um, on the product. So what we're doing here is we're bringing it out to what's called an FPC connector, which is kind of similar to our MIPI bus. So this is where a flex connector will go. It's a high speed flex connector. It's, it's a flex connector designed for carrying high speed signals that will then loop over to um, some type of um, hat product. Um, we're building a reference hat for this that will bring that 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 PCIe bus to what's called an M.2 connector. So that's a pretty standard PCIe interface for things like NVMs. It's often used in laptops and desktops and other embedded computing products. Um, but we expect that the community will, um, our, our amazing community of, of accessory manufacturers will, will be building um, all sorts of different hats that use this PCIe bus that can host all sorts of different high speed peripherals. Um, and now we've added a model indicator to the product. Um, so this was a commonly requested feature um, that, that we were getting both from our channel partners and our end users, which is once they've taken it out of the box, it's kind of hard to tell how much memory, how much RAM is, is on the product um, without being able to decode, you know, the part numbers from our, our DRAM vendors. So we've included um, a non-functional, unfortunately, a non-functional resistor that basically is fitted during the manufacturing that shows you which model the board is in terms of memory. So just an easy way to pick up a product and see, you know, the how much memory is on a product. Um, I'll just stop at this point and uh, and see um, if you have any questions. Uh, well, actually, you. Hello. hello. I'm struggling. I, I can't like really see the this. camera feed. Okay. I would like to make this conference very dynamic. So for any question, and if you answer, just let me know, and we'll give you a magnifier. We have some very good magnifiers with the light and everything. So if you have any question, and answer Chris, and Chris, let me know. 
you will have a magnifier. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? What question? <laughs> God. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, I am very ignorant about the, the potential of the Raspberry uh, Pi. So if I want to try and run an experiment like um, software on MATLAB, and also I want to add uh, some image uh, in real time, and also, I don't know, uh, to add uh, a lot of, of stuff in, the, in my experiment, what is the advantage to use Raspberry Pi and going to use uh, another uh, tool? I see, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when when you say MATLAB, are you running that on a PC? Are you simulate what what are you using MATLAB to model? Um, well, for example, I don't know. Um, so I said uh, I'm very ignorant, but um, I just want to uh, try a very heavy software in, in to 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 prove. Uh, Whatever, no, 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 like a, a very uh, topic in my in my research. Um, okay. What is the advantage using uh, Raspberry Pi? Um, 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 is my question. Okay. So um, I think I I think I understand your question a little bit. You you want to, you you're looking to use MATLAB just as a as a, a to exercise the CPU to just to to pr provide some some load. Yeah. So um, I I haven't tried running a version of MATLAB on on a Raspberry Pi, but um, I don't even know if actually Mat I, I've only ever used MATLAB on a Windows environment. So actually, I'm not sure I've ever tried. Well, I certainly haven't tried, but I haven't done any research into whether you can run MATLAB or a similar type of a modeling tool on a mathematical modeling tool on a, on a Raspberry Pi, but I think there shouldn't be any. Uh, there, there. I'm sure there are simulation tools that run under Linux that could be run on Raspberry Pi. One thing you'll find about Raspberry Pi is this version, the Raspberry Pi 5, has a, a really big step up in terms of CPU performance. You know, we're basically equivalent to, depending on how you squint, we're equivalent to a laptop from about 2016. Uh, in terms of what you get for sixty dollars, so uh, for the, for the price, it's really I think a very good amount of computing for for sixty dollars. Oh, Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can help you a little bit with this question, Chris. Uh, we sure. can we need to remember that Raspberry Pi is running by Linux, so okay. if you run MATLAB in Linux, you can work with it. It has their own special I/O operating system. So if you run MATLAB on Linux, it could work, but you need to pro uh, with all the toolboxes uh, by Linux. I think it's why why by running Windows uh, toolboxes, and also you can make a virtual machine. So instead of small computer and pocket computers, so maybe you can try it and let us know if it works. Okay. What do you say, Chris? Yeah, Can I'm just trying to look up whether MATLAB works under what MATLAB's got for Linux. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I have not tried. Have not tried <laughs> Sorry. Does he win a magnifier? I think so. Yes. Yes, I think he does. Okay. Thank you for your question. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone puts their hand up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, hi, Chris. Uh, Hello. You mentioned that uh, the new version is able to work with two cameras. We have the input for two cameras. Yes. Uh, what is the limits in if I want to make um, image processing with these two cameras mm -hmm. in real time? Yep. Yep. We designed the system to do exactly that stereo camera, stereo vision with image registration and all the sort of the goodies that go around two cameras in parallel. So uh, typically what we do is we have the hardware pipeline to support two cameras being pushed through the ISP in parallel. And then you hand those frames off to some other application to do image registration or image segmentation or whatever your your computer vision 
application is. And typically those will, you can use accelerators in our chip to do that. So you can run them on the, the ARM cores and use the hardware acceleration that's built into the ARM cores. So NEON and the, and the extensions in the ARM cores to do the, the, the mathematical computation. Or you've got um, Vulkan, which is um, it has an API for doing general purpose or G what we call GP GPU. So you can off you can use the GPU in the chip to offload some of your open um, sort of some of your um, your image processing. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. And we actually we actually have a lot of um, um, a, a number of fantastic. Uh, of our partners have built with Raspberry Pi 4 and the Compute Module 4 have built stereo camera systems already. Um, so they'll just work even better on Raspberry Pi 5. Um, I have a, another question. Sure. Um, let's say that I want to use those uh, two cameras for um, uh, facial recognition. I want to recognize emotions oh. and I want to use the two cameras. OK. Uh, so that sort of application will be will fit in that. Uh, you know, it depends. So um, I, I'm so I mean, we, we've built the system to support stereo cameras um, for 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 image processing uh, and I would say computer vision applications. Exactly what algorithms you run on them. We leave that up to the end user or the researcher or the developer to, to choose what applications they want to run. But generally speaking, our platform is used for a lot of those applications. But I can't really tell you exactly. You know, the the, the uh, face recognition algorithms are very common, and they're in inside a lot of toolkits as a default option. But in terms of like um, recognizing emotions and stuff like that, I'm not exactly sure what's available. I'm afraid. Um, but you know, we are a general purpose compute platform. So if it, if it if if the software exists, there's a good chance that it can be compiled and run on a Raspberry Pi. As well, because this is a stand. This is basically a computer. This is an ARM-based computer that runs the Linux OS. So if you can run it on your Mac or your PC, there's a good chance that you can compile it for this product and run it on um, on this product under Linux. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and also there's a huge community for Raspberry Pi. I mean, just for Raspberry Pi, and I can say that maybe the most huge and the biggest community in around the world is the Element 14 for me here so maybe you can find any information there yeah. so what do you say chris if yeah you absolutely yeah yeah definitely fire? those are two good yeah. questions yeah <laughs> um so uh, you know we'll, we'll stop at the end of each section and you can ask questions as we go through as well any more questions on pi 5 before we move on um yes uh maybe i just missed this do you um so how many pci things do you have coming off the chip and how many are dedicated to the External window. So we have four going to the Southbridge chip and one going to the connector for expansion. Okay. Does that answer your question? And they're Gen 2. Uh, the, the four going to the, um, the Southbridge chip are locked in Gen 2 mode. And the one going to the connector is, is a, uh, it's certified for Gen 2 speeds, but it is a Gen 3 interface. It is Gen 3 host. Um, and there are there are some software settings to turn it into Gen three mode, uh, but they depending on the accessory, it may not work. But we we are certified. We have certified it at Gen two. That makes sense. Yep. So what do you say, Chris? Yep. Certainly. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Any more questions? I have one, one question. Uh, well, I'm not that familiar with the, the Raspberry Pi um, interface, but um, I would like to know is that um, is this Raspberry Pi module um, certified? App, like, is there any certified application you can do with this with this device? Like, can you certify regarding like um, critical safety applications, like maybe aerospace or medical <laughs> applications? Can you do that? Good, very good question. No, is the answer to that question. Yeah, we we haven't we haven't certified the device uh, for for those applications. And one of the reasons is that this is a general purpose computer. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that people can do to this product 
you know, in software or in in terms of operation mounting, etc., that that would put it into um, a state where we couldn't certify it, if you see what I mean. So there's a lot to certify end products that work in safety critical or automotive or aerospace. We we are used in those markets, but it's up to the OEM to certify us as part of a, another part of the system, if you see what I mean. So we don't explicitly go out and certify for those industries, but people who buy our products do use them in those markets, but they do so through their own certifications, right? But it's not coming from Raspberry Pi, it's coming from the end customer. We we don't warrant our stuff for those markets um, and we, we, we wouldn't warrant our, our, our devices for that, but it's up to customers, some customers, understand the risks and they understand how to use the products and how to get them certified and they they take on that responsibility themselves but good question so what do you say yep, uh, yeah definitely <laughs> cool okay any more all right, perfect. Well, I'll, I'll keep going um, and then we'll stop at the end of this section and we have another Q&A session. Oh, so Compute Module 4, I've got my little collection of boards here. So Compute Module 4, this is based off the Raspberry Pi 4. It's basically taking all of the compute that people know and love on a Raspberry Pi 4 and cramming it down to a much smaller form factor, more integrated product that is designed to be embedded. This is designed to be embedded inside of other people's products. This is designed to take over all of the compute and wireless networking and wired networking in a, in a system uh, and run Linux for, for the end users applications. But this is basically the brains of other people's products. And it's been designed that way, but it's software compatible with the ecosystem around Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi 4. So a huge uh, improvement, a huge step up in terms of compatibility and community around the product. It's been shipping for a couple of years now, um, and um, we launched it shortly after Raspberry Pi 4 launched about three years ago, four years ago. And um, it's been a very, very fantastic product in terms of its reception and its volume and its adoption across lots of different industries. So you can find Compute Module 4 in lots of products that are digital signage products, industrial automation products, networking devices, some consumer electronics, um, remote monitoring systems, lots of network appliances. I think I've already said that one. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of different applications use Compute Module 4. And for its price, it's a fantastic value to the, to the end customer as well. And we've made some changes between um, a Pi 4 and a Compute Module 4. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So the Compute Module 4 uses the Broadcom BCM2711 CPU, which is the same CPU as what you'll find on um, a Raspberry Pi 4. It runs a little bit slower than it does on a Raspberry Pi 4 for thermal reasons. So it's 1.5 gigahertz versus 1.8 gigahertz. And we run Raspberry Pi operating system on this product, although you can install other OSs if you want. Um, our, our standard OS is based on Debian Bookworm, and we have we supply this product with tools for factory programming and provisioning. So when you put this into a product, you need some way to program it up and load, basically store your application, your operating system on the flash. So we have tools to make that easy to use. And it's a tiny little footprint, so it's much smaller than a Raspberry Pi 4. Obviously, it lacks all the connectors, but it's a high, much higher density PCB than a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, it's got four mounting holes. It does um, video decode H.264 uh, up to 4K P60. So 4,000, uh, just massive high, ultra high def. Uh, and we have uh, H.264 video decode at 1080p60 and then 1080p30 video encode. It supports OpenGL S3 graphics. And then we have a whole bunch of different options for, we have 32 SKUs of this product. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different options for men for memory, uh, for flash and for DRAM. So we have um, anywhere between one and eight gigabytes of LPDDR4 for the SD RAM, and then anywhere between zero and 32 gigabytes of eMMC. So on a Raspberry Pi 4, the file system lives on the SD card here. 
So that's fine for a whole bunch of applications. In fact, it's super useful for a whole bunch of applications. But on the compute module, some people didn't want to use SD cards. Many people didn't want to use SD cards. They didn't want removable storage. They wanted fixed storage. So we switched over to using what's called eMMC. So it's not on this board, but basically the eMMC would go here. And that's essentially flash. So it's like a solid state disk for your Raspberry Pi. And one of the great things about this product is you on the back of the board, you'll see these are the FPC connectors. Hopefully you can see those here. The FPC connectors is where you have uh, all of the IO for the for this product. And in terms of power architecture, we included a, our own PME circuitry on this product. So all you have to do is feed it a single five volt rail and it generates all the other core voltages and and IO free, uh, voltages from from that one five volt rail. So it's very, very easy power wise, very easy to power this system and it saves people having to design complicated power supplies to, to feed all the different rails required on this board. You just feed it a single five volt rail and away you go. We have versions with and without, um, with and without Wi-Fi. So that's a dual band Wi-Fi. So it's Wi-Fi wi wi in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range. And we have options for either using the onboard antenna, you'll see there's a little what's called a PCB antenna there. And then we have what's called a micro or UFL uh, connector. And the UFL connector is a very small form factor connector that can attach up to an aerial. And that aerial gets you a signal. Let's say you're putting this into a product that has um, got a metal case. Obviously the metal case is probably going to be earthed and that generates a Faraday cage. So you want to be able to, you need to be able to get your Wi-Fi signal into that metal cage um, and you do that through an external mounted antenna that comes down a little cable and attaches to that connector and that gets you your wi-fi uh, from inside the box then we have on board we have a gigabit phi so you don't need an external phi for this product you just put the magnetics for your ethernet connector so it's very inexpensive to add ethernet we have a single lane of pcie so that's a gen 2 um, and we have a single usb port at high speed and then a whole bunch of GPIO in either 1.8 or 3.3 volt IO uh, voltages. Uh, we also have a pair of HDMIs so for digital signage applications we can drive or even computing applications we can drive two separate panels or two separate HDMI monitors um, at 4k at 60 frames a second and if you're building something with embedded LCDs or cameras, we can drive two cameras or two displays uh, from this product as well, or a single camera and a single display or two cameras, two displays or any, any sort of uh, uh, combination of the above. Any questions on the Compute Module 4? Well, it's not a question. Um... Sure. Uh, could you please uh, show us the reverse of the computer? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. But, Sorry, I should have included a picture of the reverse. Yeah. So, yeah, but just a moment to put it for the So, Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that. You're breaking up a little bit. Uh, no, it's a, a request for the, the technique. The, the uh, what, sorry? No, uh, no, it's nothing. Uh, could you show, show us again, please? Oh, sure, yeah. Thank you so much. So that's, there are two, what we call FPC connectors. These are board to board connectors that carry all the signals and power and ground both in and out of the product. So there's just two connectors required. And this this connects down to the mother, so you make a, a, a uh, what we call a breakout board or an IO board, and then this board will attach to that board, and you mount it with the screws, and then that's it. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Any uh, any more questions? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the um, our microcontroller, the RP twenty forty. Uh, so this is designed in-house at Raspberry Pi. Um, it's been shipping since early in 2021. So it launched during the pandemic. Um, 
and it supports dual it's a dual core cpu it has two arm cortex m zeros so embedded microcontrollers a pair of them running at 133 megahertz and it's got a lot of on-chip memory so it's got well for a microcontroller anyway uh, it's got a quarter megabyte of on-chip sram in six independent banks that allows us to power them and depower them to save power we support up to 16 megabyte of off-chip flash on a quad spy bus. So that's a, a quad spy bus that can run at core frequency. So it gets you a fast uh, file system for the chip. It's got DMA, interpolators, and we use an LDO power supply to generate the core voltage. Um, and then we have a couple of PLLs to generate the USB and core clock. So you don't need any external clock gen for this chip. And it has 30 pins of GPIO, and four of which can be used for analog inputs. And what that gets you is like a whole bunch of peripherals that are in the product. So we can do two UARTs, two SPI, two I2C, lots of, lots of IO, basically. We have a built-in USB controller with its PHY, and it can do host and device. Uh, so what's called an OTG, or on-the-go core, uh, which is great. We can also boot from that uh, USB bus, and we have what's called a built-in UF2 bootloader that I'll talk about in a second. And one interesting thing in this chip is it has what's called PIO. And PIO is programmable IO. It's using an in-house uh, design on, it's basically our programmable IO accelerator. So it allows you to implement all sorts of different interfaces in this chip using um, this PIO as a hardware accelerator, a programmable hardware accelerator for doing IO. So it gets you timing, it gets you, it's an easy, well, not easy, but it's a straightforward way to do timing critical IO. So there's certain types of addressable LEDs that this, this device is, or this, this system is very good at controlling because it's easy to get good consistent timing without interrupt latency from this core, these cores, we have a pair of them. So that makes it very good at driving addressable LEDs, but it also allows you to do real time video output from the chip. So we can generate a VGA, a compliant VGA, or an almost compliant DVID signal out from this chip using a little bit of external circuitry, but um, doing video out basically on a 70 cent microcontroller at standard def resolutions. It's pretty, pretty amazing actually, um, but you can also use it to do what we call GPIO or general purpose IO, where you're mimicking, where you're basically implementing buses, different protocols, hardware protocols, using software that's running inside of this PIO. And that means that you can get basically programmable IO on any of your GPIO outputs. Um, and also we've got um, this, this core has been very popular with a bunch of communities. Um, and open source communities or different businesses that are implementing, you know, I, microcontroller based systems. And, and we've, it's fantastic. People have been porting different protocols to this PO system um, and then using that for, for, for solving problems in the field. So it's been a really interesting and, and exciting uh, development for, uh, for Raspberry Pi to make its first microcontroller available to the public and see the community using that 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 microcontroller and also seeing um, commercial people, commercial customers buying this in, in, in large numbers and using it to solve problems in their products. So it's been fantastic. And you'll be seeing more of this in the future from us. And we have um, some great software to go along with this great chip. So we supply a C and C++ SDK that provides all sorts of different libraries and tools, lots of example code. And we have a debugging system that uses GDB or GNU debug. Um, and that uses a port on the chip called SWD or serial wire debug. So we have a little um, debug, um, what we call the debug probe that can connect up to this chip using that 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 serial bus and allows you to go in and, and you know, basically do source level debug. We also ship uh, the chip with a Python SDK, which includes a port of MicroPython. So it's, it's that's actually the, the, I think the funnest way to program this chip. You can get up and running with Python in literally a matter of minutes with this chip and our Pico product line. And we have a built-in UF2 bootloader. And what this means is you could hold down a button on 
uh, a board that has this chip. So single button, and we call that the boot select button. And you hold that down, plug the chip into a computer, and then the whole chip and its, and its storage appears as a file system. And then you drag your, your software over, literally drag it from, you compile it on your PC or your Mac or your Linux box. You drag it over, drop, drop it onto that, that folder, that file, the drive, and it programs the flash automatically. And then you unplug the board, press go, and then it starts running your software. So it's like instant, basically instant programming. Uh, it makes it very easy to use. And it's you can't brick your system either. You can't blow up that bootloader. That bootloader is based baked into the, the silicon. It's actually programmed into the silicon at the manufacturing of, of the device. Um, and again, a fantastic community that is built up around this chip that we're very proud of. Yeah, and we have uh, four versions of our Pico line. So one of the the one of the reasons we made the RP twenty forty was to use it on our own products. So we have four versions of Pico. We have the standard Pico, we have Pico with headers, Pico H, and Pico W, which has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and then a version of Pico W that has Wi-Fi and headers as well. So. And these are anywhere between four and seven dollars, so really inexpensive. Cool. Um, that was pretty much it. Um, any um, any more questions? Oh, I see a few, few hands go up. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I didn't catch that. I think you have to go closer to the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, yeah. Oh. Hi. Well, I have a question about the PIO uh, part. Yeah. Because in the presentation, it, uh, it has a bullet that says each PIO has four state machines. Yes. And I've been working with state machines and better nets and all of that. And I don't know how it benefits uh, to have uh, four state machines in a PIO. Uh, I really don't understand why it is important to focus on, on that or, or have it in the presentation. OK, so each PIO core, so, so state machines, you can use, you can chain the state machines together to make more complicated things. So let's say a UART, a UART uses two state machines, but SPY uses, I think, three state machines. So you chain them together to make more complicated peripherals. Does that make oh, sense? So you can, you can uh, chain the state machines. Oh, yeah. a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you so, so some peripherals, simple peripherals only use, let's say, one or two state machines. Complicated peripherals use three or four. Well, the, the Raspberry Pi uh, in lock has two state machines, no? It has two PIO <laughs> blocks, each with four state machines. So two oh, symmetric right. two symmetric PIOs. Each one has, so there's eight state machines in total divided up by two PIO cores, identical PIO cores. And the reason there are two identical is so you can run two completely separate IO operations in parallel. OK, well, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Good question. I have two questions. Sure. And uh, the first one is, what is the resolution for the ADC model? The NEC? Uh, ADC. ADC model. Or oh, ADC. Analysis? Yeah, we have an ADC in the RP2040, yep. What is the resolution? Oh, oh, good question. I think it's 12 bits. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And the second one is, are there internal interruptions, for example, activated by the PWM? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch. I just caught PWM. I missed the bit before that. Ah, okay. Um, are there inter internal interruptions? Internal interrupts for what? Uh, in, in there, the, in the models, uh, oh. it, it exists uh, interruptions for activate another processes. 
Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have interrupt controllers. Yes, we have programmable interrupt controllers that talk to the ARM CPUs to interrupt the ARM when certain things are. You can set thresholds all over the chip. We're really complicated interrupt controllers. So you can set thresholds on DMAs and chain DMAs and um, FIFOs and all sorts of different interrupts. And you can have hardware interrupts coming into the chip from GPOs that tell the CPU that something's happened. You can even do interrupts into PIO as well, and you offload, that's kind of a cool feature, the, 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 the PIO processing cores can understand their own interrupts. So you can have signals coming into the chip and different software running based on GPO state. You can read state as well. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. What do you say, Chris? Uh, definitely, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, both of the last two were good questions. Yeah. All right. Yep. Chris, what about the current consumption in the new versions? Is there any advantage compared to the previous version? Um, we actually use a little bit more power. <laughs> so, um, to be fully honest oh, and oh. transparent, the chip uses, uh, well. You get twice as much, so it is more efficient, but the total power consumption of the system has gone up. Um, but in terms of your milliwatts, well, joules, really, it's actually, it's like you can do more. It, it does this. So for the same compute load, you, it will be lower power. But the total power consumption, we've doubled the performance of the system, but the power consumption hasn't doubled. It's only gone up by, I don't know, uh, uh, less than half. So, um, it is more efficient, but the total, the worst case power in terms of the maximum compute at worst case loads is higher, but the efficiency is better. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. So I think there's no more questions. Oh, no more questions. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, look, thank you very much, everyone. I have one question. Oh, sure, yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation of the Raspberry Pi 5. Uh, the community here uh, works on robotics, aeronautics, automatic control, biomedical engineering, and computer science. So, but uh, from the point of the academic uh, applications. So, uh, uh, so let me get a little bit angry and 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 to ask you uh, what is what is the main difference in terms of uh, technological advantage in cost of the Raspberry Pis uh, with uh, because most of the our, our student worked on Arduinos, oh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they are very uh, uh, familiar with Arduinos and applications because of the cost. And yep. the simplicity to, to be applied and in blocks uh, with available software and so on. So, uh, which is uh, why the Raspberry Pi would be better. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Um, the, the, the Raspberry Pi single board computers are, are, are Linux based computers. So, they're very different from embedded microcontroller based products. This is a you know, a full computer runs a, a desktop operating system and, and an open OS, you know, big, 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 what we call big iron. That's a, a lot of computing power. Um, Raspberry Pi has embedded microcontrollers. This embedded microcontroller, the RP2040, is actually used by Arduino to build some of their products. So we're big fans of Arduino. We love what they're doing. Um, the Pico product line is, is, a, is a great product to build a, a, a small embedded microcontroller doing real time stuff, real time IOs, real time uh, message passing, real time, you know, uh, PWM control of motors and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so we, we have different products for different applications. Um, so it's sort of up to the end user which one they go with. It's which one, like there's a set of requirements that probably will push them down the Linux path We'll push them down the embedded real time path, um, but we we support both camps and and all the use cases in between. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. One more Thanks. question. Sure. Um, there's some applications where we use the Arduino in order to get better analog uh, uh, acquisition of signals in order to tra transfer into digital. 
Yeah. Uh, Raspberry Pi uh, coupled with an Arduino makes efficient analog data acquisition. But how would you uh, arrange this in order to uh, dispose the Arduinos and do all the analog acquisition only with the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, so there's A to D chips out there that are specifically designed for doing high quality A to D work. Um, you can hook those up to um, the RP2040 directly. Um, it depends on which one. I mean, there's all sorts of um, A to Ds out there. The A to D that we have in our chip is, is, is okay. You know, there are higher quality A to D chips out there because we're not just an A to D chip, we're a microcontroller as well. So there are dedicated pieces of silicon out there for doing a high quality analog to digital conversion that you can wire up to, to the RP2040. You could wire it up to uh, the parallel bus on um, via PIO if you wanted to using that programmable IO. That'd be a, a nice thing to do. Get it wired up to a 12 or 10 bit or 12 bit bus on that, no problem. Um, or um, I mean, a high speed serial as well as another option too. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No problem. I'm just looking at the A the ADC. Uh, yeah, it is a twelve. It's a twelve bit A, A to D. And okay. how many ports? Sorry. Channels. The ADC. How many channels? Four inputs, and one is the internal temperature sensor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Perfect. So I think there's no more question, Chris. Okay, so I want well, to thank you so much. So much. That was well, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. It's been great chatting to you all. And yeah, um, yeah I wish you a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. We also have two demos of Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi 4 and the Raspberry Pi 400. So if you want to check it out, it's just good for the whole. Thank you. 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 Thank